The BSO is very, very special for so many reasons. I mean, we're, we're really blessed with our hall. Symphony Hall is, is just an amazing space in which we get to work and we get to rehearse on stage for all of our performances, which I thought was, was a given. But apparently not all ensembles have that advantage. So we're always, we always get to hone our sound. We always get to hone balance. Um, so that's just, you know, talking about the structure of where we get to work, but the personnel is amazing. Uh, I'm really, really lucky. I feel very lucky because I get to sit on stage with some of my favorite musicians every day. Every day of the week, you know, for our, our symphony season and also out at Tanglewood. So that's been a wonderful experience for me and I feel like it's been the ultimate finishing school because I just, I had gotten this job right out of Curtis. So to come here and experience that firsthand was it's just indescribable. Nobody could have told me what that was going to be like. So when people come to play in an ensemble like the Boston Symphony, I think, I imagine, and because this is what I used to think also, that you show up at a job like this, you're lucky enough to win an audition, you show up to play in the Boston Symphony, and you think that you're a fully formed musician. But you're not really. I wasn't. I was so green when I first showed up here. So when I say this was my finishing school, I really mean it. I, f I feel like musically I've learned so much more because there's something about the process of rehearsing with these people all the time and learning how to play with them and, you know, really, really, you know, doing a lot of active listening, but also just experiencing what top-notch musicians can do on a day-to-day -day basis and how that communal experience and also, the, the, the BSO is really unique in that there's such a wonderful um, collective memory. So from performance to performance, there's an actual evolution that happens, but then it's layered over years and years of history and memory of how things were done years ago. Even if it was like three or four years ago, you can actually hear the new experience layered on top of what we had done just a short time back. I enjoy teaching. I really enjoy teaching. I don't like to do it that often because I'm very, very conscious of the fact that it's a huge responsibility. Um, you know, teaching somebody how to play the violin is, is, is not something I take lightly. And I don't just mean from a musical standpoint, but very often you're working with somebody on a physical setup and hopefully you're going to be coaching them on how to practice and how to think about music and how to maximize their time and at the same time ultimately enjoy what they're doing. So it's a huge responsibility. I don't, I, I, I would probably teach more if I felt a little less passionately about it, but I, I enjoy it. It always helps me rethink my approach. It always helps when you have to explain to somebody how something is done and how I've broken down a problem and, you know, finding a fresh approach to something that I've been doing ever since I was four, it helps you well, I guess the best way to put it is it helps me rethink things. It reminds me of something I read once about teaching where somebody was asked the same question. Why do you teach and why do you love to teach? And they compared it to fishing. And I thought it was the funniest analogy, but then this person went on to say, it's like fishing. You know, you, you cast your bait. You know, you, you put something on the hook and you cast. And you keep casting. And every once in a while, you catch a fish. And it's that wonderful moment, this wonderful moment of, I guess, serendipity when something you've said, you throw everything out there. Sometimes you try, you know, an audible example, sometimes you try verbal, sometimes you try, you know, fixing a setup. But there's always that moment of when the student understands exactly what you're trying to say, where, where you just feel like, all right, I caught the fish, now I can start to work. So it doesn't always happen, but when it does happen, it's very exciting. Oh, when I'm not working, I love to travel. So most of the time, you know, when we get our new date books, I'll look through 
the season and I'll see when I can get away. Not because I don't like it here. I love Boston. I love my job. But I really, there's nothing more exciting to me than, you know, picking a place on a map and going and, and seeing something new and seeing how other people live. And, you know, and when I'm there, I, I like to see what, uh, I don't know, just one, 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 of the, one of my favorite things to do when I'm abroad is to go to a local grocery store and see how people shop. It's always very interesting to me to see what people are buying for dinner and to see what's on the shelves. Um, so along with the grocery store theme, I love to eat, um, you know, fine dining, I like to cook. I'd never had a chance to live abroad and that was something I'd always wanted to do. And I had that opportunity during the 2009-2010 season. And a good friend of mine who runs an orchestra, one of the orchestras in Berlin, had invited me to come play there for a year and I just, I jumped at the opportunity. And I was really lucky that the BSO was able to let me go for a year. So I finally had my year abroad experience, you know, living as an expat, absolutely loved it. So I'd have to say Berlin is one of my favorite places to live and work. And there are a lot of places in the world that are great to visit, but, you know, I can't imagine myself working there and, you know, having a day-to-day -day quotidian experience. But Berlin, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um. Well, one in particular, one season highlight I'm looking forward to this year is the Mahler's Three. Um, just because that was something that we performed my very first season in the BSO and everything my first season was so scary and so wonderful and so intimidating and I had never worked on anything at, you know, in that scale, so the performance like Mahler 3 and we took that on tour on my very first tour in March of 1998 with Seiji and for me every aspect of that tour was was a fascinating experience. I'd never done a professional symphony tour and you know getting to play in some of these wonderful halls for the very first time ever was was also awe-inspiring and intimidating and this was the first time I ever played for example at the Musikverein. So I have very very fond memories of this piece. There's always something new, there's always something interesting. Um, so we're opening with Beethoven 7 this season we just did it at Tanglewood and it's another one of these things where I don't really think about it. And then we sit down and we, we begin to play and this wonderful sound comes out of the orchestra and some of the solos are slightly different depending on how our principals are feeling and the balance might be slightly different and, and every time there's just something fresh, something interesting and when you have 90 to 100 people on stage and you, 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 know, you factor in that human element Magic happens very often. Not every night, but very often we get magic on that stage. Mm -hmm.